Hey, everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. You guys, welcome to the show. We have just kicked off a new series that we're all really excited about, and it's called For the Love of the Middle. And it just, it occurred to us that we wanted to host a series of conversations about sort of this place, mainly really kind of where I am and so many of you are right in the middle of life. So we have a variety of new things we're dealing with. Our parents are getting older. Um, We're in a different phase of our career. Our bodies are doing some things that we're not accustomed to and they're changing. And our kids are growing up and in a lot of our cases, launching, they're leaving, they're moving out. And there's just so many new things to deal with kind of all at once. And it's hard to find a lot of instruction on it. It's fun. It's hard to find community around it or conversations. And so I'm going to go ahead and apologize mamas to you right now. Cause we're going to, we're going to hit the feels a little on today's episode. Um, we're going to be talking about a little thing called empty nesting today. And I don't know how you feel about that. I think we're kind of all over the place on it, but a lot of you are going to be kind of choked up just thinking about it because look, we, we gave their, these monsters our all, right? We gave them a couple of decades or more. Um, I, I will tell you that my five got every last drop of me for the entirety of the time they've been alive. Um, and so obviously I am moved. I'm already in this phase. I've got four of them out of the house. A couple of them are still in college. Those sort, sort of middle and I've got one left at home. Um, and I feel all over the place about it. Sometimes I'm like, look at them go. I'm proud. I'm excited. It's so fun to watch them fly. Sometimes I'm like, it's lonely and weird in this house. And I miss the teen energy and I miss all the chatter and I miss all their friends. Um, sometimes I worry because they're also in the young adult stage where they're not making all the decisions I want them to make. <laughs> they're not following the script, right? I'm just all over the place. And sometimes I'm like, this is awesome. Like I've been, you know, I, I did a completely empty nest trial last semester when Remy was in Spain. And so I didn't have anybody live here for four months and I got a little trial and there were parts of it that I loved. And so it's just, I, I just don't know. You know, I just don't know. It depends on what day you ask me how I feel about this. So whether you're on the cusp of empty nesting or you're in it or you've got a few years before it hits, um, whatever, we are going to chat about some things today that I hope will serve you as you move into this next phase. It's a empty nesting is not talked about enough as a major life life shift. And it is major. I mean, major, like we talk about college and marriage and kids and retirement and all this stuff, like onboarding kids. And that's all true and well and good. But, but kids leaving like the empty nest is just not spoken about enough. I I don't know if we avoid talking about it because we feel anxious around it or we're sad about it or we're worried about, I'm not sure. Um, But, but here we are. And so it's this huge moment that we're ill prepared for because we've spent their entire lives, like nurturing them and protecting them and raising them. And, um, and it is weird. We don't have any muscle memory for them moving out of this house and making their own choices. It is bizarre, right? So I love my guest for this conversation. Um, For those of you who might not know Dr. Burns or remember him from his first time on this show back in 2018 during our parenting series back then, let me tell you about this incredible man. He is the president of Homeward, which is a nonprofit organization where he and his team share advice and wisdom that really help guide families and parents and kids through all phases of life. Um, The last time he was on, he talked about how to be a parent to your adult children, but also how to not parent as much. Um, Just before my kids were on the precipice of all that. So it was, I was like starving for all of his advice and his words really stayed with me and have been wildly instructive as I navigate my life with all my newly minted young adults. Um, Dr. Burns speaks to thousands and thousands of people around the whole entire globe every year. He's got more than 2 million resources in print in 20 different languages. I'm telling you, he's like credentialed. Um, Now his main areas of expertise include speaking about things like marriage, 
confident parenting, empowering our kids all along the way at all points in the spectrum and becoming healthy leaders. And these are things that I think we all aspire to really. Um, You've probably heard of some of his most popular books, uh, Doing Life with Your Adult Children, which we talked about last time. And one that's going to be super relevant to our discussion today, which is Finding Joy in the Empty Nest. Uh, Jim and his wife, Kathy, live in OC in Southern California. They've got three grown daughters who went off and got married and have their own babies. So he doesn't just know what he's talking about as a professional, but he knows what he's talking about as a dad. So if you haven't already, go back and hit play on our last episode. Um, if you need more than what you hear today, because he is gold. Um, that one was called, by the way, Parenting Through All Stages, When to Hold On and When to Let Go. And it's all just good, 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 practical, meaningful stuff. I enjoy him so much. He's delightful. I love his energy, his warmth, his compassion, and his wisdom. So you guys, please enjoy this conversation with the absolutely wonderful Dr. Jim Burns. Dr. Burns, welcome back to the For the Love podcast. I'm so happy to see you again. Just so, well, so, so happy to see, to see you again. So it's been a minute since you were on here last. I yeah. think you were with me last in like maybe even 2018. Yeah. Can you just tell my audience briefly what you have been up to since yeah. we talked about the topic of your last book, Doing Life with Your Adult Children? Yeah. Well, I talk about it a lot because it hit a nerve uh, in the world. And so I still talk about that a lot. And a lot of people, you know, have a lot of questions about that. And, you know, I mean, I mentioned to you and it's the same with the empty nest issues. I mean, part of it was research, but part of it was just desperation because that's what Kathy and I were going through. And so, uh, you know, I talk a lot about that. Homeward, the organization I work with is the largest provider of parenting Mm -hmm. seminars in the U.S. We keep doing it. And it's a privilege to do that and talk to moms and dads about uh, how to help their kids become responsible adults. I've got five kids. Four of them are out. Yeah. My my fourth kid is a freshman in college. Now, granted, it's 20 minutes up the up the street but he lives there he lives on campus it's it's a launch so i'm down to one kid in the house she's a junior and i know i I am sort of like more or less the median age of my audience like my crowd is kind of like me and they're aging with me and so this is where a lot of us are we are either going through the launch season or we're about to yes Yes. And so yes. let's start here because I'm, I'm going to get your expertise here in just a second, of course. I'd like to take it personal with you for just a second. Can yeah. you talk about your sort of personal experience when your girls moved out and yeah. started the, their own lives? How how yeah. did you and Kathy handle it? Did you handle the same? Were you guys the same mm-hmm. on this or were one of you over here and one here? Um, what were those first days like? Were you ready Did it creep up on you? Were you surprised by any of your feelings or reactions, either good or bad? Um, Either way, like, did anything surprise you about that? And then what did you sort of use to cope or manage? Let me give you an experience. So we drop off. We were talking about Heidi. We drop off Heidi. She's our youngest at school. And, you know, we've done the weekend uh, putting together Bed Bath & Beyond and Target runs and all that stuff. Totally. A lot of energy, a lot of excitement. And we get in the car and we don't talk to each other for a while like a half an hour driving back home. And it's about a four and a half hour drive. Yeah. And I look over at Kathy and all of a sudden I see a tear running down her cheek. She's looking out the window and I said, are you okay, babe? She goes, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I go, it doesn't look like you're fine. And she goes, I don't want to talk about it. So then mm, 10 minutes later, I said, hey, we were in central California coming down the coast where we live in in Orange County. And and I said to uh, her, hey, do you want to stop in Santa Barbara? great restaurant. We always go to it's lunch, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. You want to stop for lunch? And she said, no, no, I, I, I'm okay. Mm-hmm. You're, you're okay. You don't want to have lunch at this place yeah. that overlooks the ocean. On That's and on. right. So we finally drive straight home and I'm a little miffed at this because oh, I mean, no. I'm, I'm in a, a different place, right? Yeah. I mean, I was really sad that Heidi left. I cried when, you know, we hugged her and she wanted yeah. us to go kind of, yeah. but we get home and it is really quiet. And we had not been in a quiet and we had not prepared for this. You talked about people preparing, even you having a conversation with me with a junior is a big Mm. deal because Mm -hmm. I don't think most people prepare. Mm. So we sat there and uh, I said, you want me to go get Baja fish, which is a taco place, you know, not not exactly expensive. And she goes, no, I think I'll just have some soup. 
Okay. And that says to me All there's right. something wrong. There's just warning signs everywhere exactly. right now. Yes. And and then surprisingly, the band at the high school starts playing because my girls, I have three daughters, no hormones yeah. or drama in our life. No. And what, what happened with them was they were gymnasts who became cheerleaders. So we were at mm. nine years of football sitting in the uh-huh. cheer section, may I add, uh-huh. the dad uh-huh. out here. Sure, sure. And, uh, and Kathy, here's the band and she goes, maybe we should go. Uh-huh. And I was like- Whoa, I, I oh. don't know we should go. She goes, well, that's where our friends are. That's kind of where life has been. Oh. And I and I said to her um, somewhat prophetically, because I had no idea what I was doing, but I said, maybe we need to reinvent our life and mm. maybe not go at that point. Yeah. And she looked at me and I think she almost wanted to, I mean, she's never slapped me in the face, but she's yeah. wanted to she several times. Yeah. But I think she wanted to slap me because by me saying that, I didn't even say mm. it sarcastically, but I yeah. went, maybe we need to reinvent our life and not go back to that. And uh, you know what? We have talk- talked about that that time. It was a tough time for us, Jen. We mm. um, and, and and then we took it differently. Kathy had what we call the empty nest syndrome. I write about it in in the empty nest book. I created a quiz, but she was the sun, and there were three planets around her. And in the house, I was the other planet. So I mean, basically, you got four planets, and all of a sudden no planets are revolving around the sun here and she's got trying to figure out what to do. And she experienced, she she talks about this much more articulate than me, but she experienced some depression, some anxiety and like, Whoa, what am I going to do now? She's a specialist with autism. So she had already gone, she did good things. She'd already gone back to work where she hadn't for Mm -hmm. a while, but she had gone back and was, was teaching. So Mm -hmm. that was really meaningful to her, but that still didn't do it for me. I didn't think I had the empty nest syndrome. And then I noticed, wait, I'm going to work an hour earlier and I'm staying an hour later. Oh. And I had this, a similar experience, to be honest, nobody yeah. would have seen that coming. And what I found mm. when I started doing focus groups on empty nest was that the women were much more aware of the loss. Yeah. The men, and I'm not, I'm generally speaking because that's sure. not with everybody, but the men just did what I did. I mean, they just mm-hmm. went, okay, I'll, I'll keep on doing what I've been doing but really stuffing things. So I find mm-hmm. that a lot of the people, um, and I think Kathy and I did some of this too, they they buried things in their own marriage because they put so much energy in with their kids. Of course. Uh, you know, we we have to talk about, when you talk about empty nest, you have to understand, I mean, what, just a little, I mean, almost half, not all half, but you know, you have single empty nesters. Yeah. So now it's even more quiet because at totally. least we could lean on each other. But in the single empty nest, That's you know, right. they're, they're, they're saying, okay, wait, I have a special bond with my kids, but they had mm. huge, two huge losses. They had the loss of their child leaving, which we all have, but then they also have the loss of things that maybe just like in a marriage, you buried things in a single, maybe it was the divorce, maybe it was the death, but they have to kind of now look at that again in a different way. Right. And so those are big deals. Um, and and big deals. I didn't see that coming. Kathy didn't see that coming. Now mm. we've had boomerang. We had boomerang eight sure. times. Right. <laughs> so they, right. They came back, right. You know? Totally. But, totally. But you know, the average person is pretty much, I'm guessing, you know, more your age, the, the average person who goes, you can Google me on this is 48.9 goes into the empty nest. That means yeah. that some of those people are saying, wait, I'm going to spend more time in the empty nest right. than I did with my kids. And I just put two decades of That's energy right. to three decades of energy with kids every day, making yeah. it happen. I mean, it's understandably disorienting. Really, totally. like uh, it makes a perfect and exact sense. And I appreciate you saying that it takes the men by surprise, but they still experience yeah. it. Oh, um, yeah. That makes yeah. sense to me. Uh, oh, the oh, moms are their- having this conversation. Like, exactly. They they yeah. they are. The moms are much better at having that communication uh-huh. than the men. The men are either bearing it or they're going in their own midlife crisis or whatever. Not every man and not every woman. I mean, again, we can generalize on this. Yeah. But what I found was that some of the men actually didn't handle this very good at all. C.S. Lewis mm-hmm. one time said, you know, change it is loss. Mm. And uh, I think the woman is aware of the loss, mm-hmm. you know, where for me, I was like, even I had been so mad at my girls because they were all messy like me and they yeah. would throw their you know towels yeah. on the floor and all this kind sure. of stuff. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I would go into the bathroom where my girls hung out um, fighting because they all uh, sure. had that one. Yeah. Bathroom. And, um, and I would go, where are the towels? I, yeah. I miss the towels. I miss their, yeah. I miss their attitude, you know, even some of that. And then I would go, and what am I going to do now? You know, cause, yeah. because there's a lot of time I'm, we're making this sound so bad and it doesn't have to be uh-huh. honestly, that's but, right. Yeah, I'm talking we'll about finding there. joy, but we'll get there. the point, but the point being is I, I 
realized that I missed a lot of the stuff, just the action, the energy. Yeah, uh, I liked being Christy's dad, Rebecca's dad, um, when I was introduced. I liked being Heidi's dad um, mm-hmm. when I was introduced, rather than you know whatever I do in work. And um, and all of a sudden, I'm not their dad because I'm not around any yeah. of their their friends or their or, uh, or their friends' parents. Of course, I mean, yeah. just the the truth is that the raising kids years, they are the kind of they're kind of a center point of the home. And so yeah. I don't, I, 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 I dipped my toe into this. Um, when my fourth kid, when my son went to college, right about the same time, just a couple of weeks later, my last kid, my junior, spent all of last semester in Spain as a foreign exchange student. So they You're both right, yes. went out at the same time and she was yeah. gone for four months. And so I, and then since you and I talked last, I have experienced a divorce too. And so what I always expected to be, oh, well, the two of us are left here. And so now finally we get our prize from like raising kids. So it's very different because I'm the single um, empty nester that you're talking about. And um, it was bizarre, just bizarre. I have, I mean, I have five kids. It's, it's been buzzing in my house since 1998, you know, because it's them and it's all their friends. And I haven't had a moment's quiet and I don't, two decades. And so it's just strange. We don't have any muscle memory for it. I would not say it's all bad. It it wasn't even that I was like, this is terrible. I was just like, this is weird. Yeah. This is weird. I do. I I have no precedence for being in a house without teen energy. I yeah. just don't know what this is. And it felt a little lonely. And I want to ask you, now that you have spent a fair amount of your professional time thinking yeah. this through right, right, and coaching other parents through and experiencing right. it just as a person, right. right, I don't even know if there's, I don't even know if there's an answer to this question, but would you say there are any handful of measures or um, approaches or whatever that parents can do on the, as they're on ramping to launch. So the kids are in high school. It's not that far away. It feels like it to parents who've never launched a kid. You're like, Oh, you're sophomores. This is going to go on forever. I'm like, no, it is not. It's (laughs) almost over. Like you are at the finish line. Like, is there anything we can do? So this doesn't catch us so unaware. Yeah. Well, I think our conversation is a great conversation because I think we have to talk about preparing for it. And the people who did the best at the beginning, you know, when, when there was the launch, are the people who actually kind of prepared for it. So, for example, my wife, when Heidi, our youngest, was a yeah. junior, she said, you know, I'm going to go back to work and work part time. Um, she's a teacher with kids who, have, who are on the on the spectrum. And she loved that. And she was great at it. But she yeah. said, you know, right during this season. I'm going to put my energy here with the kids and then, you know, maybe I'll come back to it. That was a good move for her. Hmm. The other thing that I see are when people say, you know what, instead of waiting until the empty nest, it's when they take up um, uh, going all of a sudden they go, you know what, I haven't been to the gym in like, you know, nine years and I'm going to, you know, go take a class or I'm going to do this kind of a thing. Um, It's the people who ease into the empty nest instead Hmm. of just the abrupt part. Yeah. The people who have the abrupt experience, which most of us do, to be honest, yeah. that was us in many ways, that they don't do as well. But it's mm. the people who who actually kind of prepare about it. And I know somebody who did one of I was so impressed with this. Their their kid was a junior, uh it's a wonderful couple who I know and they took a week vacation and they drove someplace, I can't, you know, Colorado. And they talked about this. What what do we want to do when, mm. you know, Barry, their kid goes away to college? Because it's not like they're not the key. They still call you all your kids still call you mom, even though they don't live That's there. Right. right. And, and so what do you do? And and so they actually talked about some basic little things and it was interesting because none of them were, were big or fancy, but mm-hmm. you know, they talked about, you know, putting some energy into friendships. One of the positive things that That's I, good. that I saw was that with people who um, had good friends, adult friends, because let's face it. I mean, there's a season for a lot of people where you don't really yes. have a lot of friends because your friends yes. are, you know, the soccer friends or the this or that. 100%. You're not putting energy into it. It's the other team parents. Yeah. yeah, you're spending time with, you know, what I call VDPs, very draining people because they're always going to be around. But what about the VIPs, the people you lean into? The people who did well mm. early on made decisions to, I don't care if it meant join a club, 
yeah. you know, do whatever they were going to do. Um, I found it. I, I um, laughed about this because I saw something that that you had uh, had sent my way. The, I started reading uh, mom blogs, empty nest mom blogs. I mean, this is going to be good. Oh, that it just it scared me. With no offense to mom blogs, now some of these people are my favorite people, the empty nest sure. mom bloggers. But they're like, yeah, so take up bird watching and take up, oh, yeah. you know, this and that. And I'm like, ah, I don't want that. I want I something want more to. meaningful and more purposeful. Yeah. yeah. So what I found was sure. Some of those people found meaning by having experiences outside of their own life, and they'd always wanted to be, quote, unquote, a bird watcher again. <laughs> yes. No burn on bird watchers. I, sure. I respect them. I just don't know the difference between a parakeet and an eagle, and that's my Same. problem, not their problem. But again, it's it's things that were going to feed your own life, feed your soul. Yeah. You know, We didn't that's do good. that. We had to do that. You can do it both ways, but mm-hmm. the people who do well do it in the uh, in the prep time to answer That's your right. question, not in not in the time where you're like, hey, so what are we going to do now? And you have a lot of a lot more free time. Mm. I think you're completely right. And that's not magic. It's not sorcery. It's not even that. It's not that challenging. No, it does require intention. Yep. If you are going to build any space at all um, into the rest of your community or your friend group or your hobby or your, yep. you know, little passion yep space. Yeah. You will have to choose it in advance. No. Um, I, no. I have done that for a lot of years. My parents modeled this. And so I never really knew another way. I thought this was just what yeah. you did, but yeah. I have spent my entire adult life deeply investing in and being invested in by my friends. So yeah. we've got a locked in friend group. And we spend, I mean, a ton of time together. We take trips yeah. together. We're like, right. we live in the same neighborhood. We're friends, friends. And right. um, I noticed that really matters. Yeah. That really yeah. matters. Yeah. Well, you have what I call replenishing relationships. You know, the mm. American person, the American adult, 50 and over, they're very lonely people. In fact, there's a mm. lot of st- studies on this. And it's because they don't have replenishing relationships. You just described something that is the heart dream, a felt need, but you got to lean into it. You know, one of the the best phrase that I have in my head on this is, uh, uh, you know, successful and a well-lived life is never accidental. So, Mm. and that takes time to to have the kind of friendships. I've been in a small group every Tuesday morning, 21 years. Oh my goodness. So, so with these guys, I mean, first we talked about sports and politics and anything to stay away from talking about marriage. One day a guy opened up his life and he said, you know what, I'm Mm. dying in my marriage right now. And we all jumped in. We opened up our kimonos, if you will. And, you know, today... Not only do we have a lot of fun, and we do a, a guy's trip every year, hmm. um, which is awesome, And uh, but it's also that we, we hang out. You know, yesterday there was another event. One of our guys was in, being interviewed in it. We all showed up, and I, I didn't know the entire group was going to be there, and it was a big oh. investment. It was like nine to two. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah. man, I, I don't want to spend nine to two to this event, yeah. but I did, and I sat next to him. And when he came off the stage twice, he's, he's a businessman. I just said, great job. Pat him on the back, wrote him a love note afterwards on and on. But the point being yeah. is all of us were there and yeah. none of us had talked about it. We'd seen each other Tuesday, but we showed up, you know, a couple days later. It's so good. Cause we love this guy. Well, you know what? I am beyond measure. Um, fortunate. I'm a better husband, a better, yeah. uh, a, a father, yeah. you know, just a better person because I have these guys in my life. Same with you. You of just course. described, you just described what happened to me when I started doing focus groups on the empty nest and interviewing people saying, how do you, fi- how did you find joy? Or do you have any joy? Mm. When they said they had friendships, they did well. And when they said they didn't have friendships, by the way, yeah. one of the number one things for singles in that too. And I write a chapter on that because it was so, it's so prevalent and I couldn't find stuff on single in the empty nest. I mean, they were like couples, oh. you know, now you can run around the house naked and it's going to be that great. That is I'm like, so true. Yeah. But what I found was that the people who had deep friendships and actually invested in something meaningful for them was that's, that was kind of the secret to their success. And I found that's a, a bigger number factor. Of, yeah. I found a number of, of people and I'll be honest with you, mainly women, not as many men had that mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. I believe you. Yeah. Um, I believe you. And I also believe that that is the key that turns the luck and yeah. you don't have to be partnered or in a marriage to experience that. And that was, that right. was the case for me because all yeah. of my friends are married. They're a yeah. bunch of marrieds. And so, right. Right. Uh, cause we've been friends forever. These are old friends, yeah. not new friends. Right. And right. Um, it, it just didn't matter. It just, yeah. at our age, 
It's like everybody in the boat, who cares? Like it doesn't, there's not this sense of being coupled and single in the frame. So, but it, there they were. And it wasn't just, um, all those sort of heart connections. It was also time because now I I had something to do. I had somewhere to go. I had people to be with and I wasn't just home going, why are my toilets so clean? You know, like, <laughs> why are all my cups on the shelf? Yeah. Like, why do I have all my forks? Okay. Um, yeah. Well, you, you was, get the finding joy lapel pin today because yeah. honestly, you're, you're saying what people are, they need to do a lot of times in the single crowd. What we found was the ones who were struggling, they also went, well, I'm single for this reason. So I'm not going to hang out with my married friends. And oh. yet there was a woman who I love and adore who uh, went through a divorce and she still does Taco Tuesday with some of the same couples. Sure. And she goes, and I love it. And I go, is it awkward at all? And she goes, I never even think about it. You know, same. she goes, I just have conversation with everybody. Um, she goes, I, I, I miss not having a partner and, yeah. you know, all this kind of stuff. But I don't want to jump into that because that could, you know, be a yeah. mess for me, she said. Yeah. But Taco Tuesday, she goes, I actually look forward to ta- – we did Taco Tuesday's marriage. And we did Taco Tuesday single, and I actually like a better single because I'm even looking more forward to it. Good move on her part. I, I couldn't agree more. On my very first single Valentine's Day, and I was married for 26 years, so it's no yeah. joke. I, I, I didn't yeah. have any adult memories as a single. Yeah. I was a right. 19-year-old bride. So right. um, on my very first single Valentine's Day, and I was still in a free fall back then. Yeah, yeah sure. I went out with my best friends and their husbands. Table of seven. <laughs> Three couples, right. and she, it did I not even it. occur to me to be weird no. about it or them. Yeah. They were just yeah. like, pull it up. So no. that well, that is possible. We don't yeah, have to apply possible. a limiting belief on the no, community no. just because we think, well, it's supposed no. to look this, or I thought it was going to look this way, yeah. and it looks different. Yeah. And, and may I add that that you're unique on that because a lot of people – I were I am on a show called New Life Live and it's a it's the largest Christian counseling show in the country and and we get calls of people who go my I my married friends left me you know I got <laughs> I went through this divorce and they left me so what you did yeah. was you leaned into it cuz mm-hmm. I hear most every day the story of somebody who's like bitter and angry at mm-hmm. the friendships thing and that's when you have to kind of you know if if your friends aren't going to do that either you lean in or yeah. you still find others when you already feel abandoned, you know, in a mm. time when you don't need to feel abandoned, but you did it, you did it right. Mm. You're the, uh, you're the, the role model on that one. Yeah. I would say my friends are, they, yeah. they yeah. stuck like barnacles to me. And yeah. for a while they just breathed there for me. And right. so I couldn't shake them if I wanted to, if I tried <laughs> to say, I don't want to be in y'all's friend group anymore. They would be like, we're not having it. This episode is sponsored by better help. We're in this series on the pod called For the Love of the Middle, like the middle of life, where so many new things are happening at once. This series is also a reminder that getting to know ourselves is literally a lifelong process, especially when we have seasons of transition and newness constantly. This has been completely true in my own life. I've gone through so much change um, on the outside and the inside in the last few years, and I feel like I know this me better than ever. I owe a ton of that work. Um, to therapy, which has been key in my journey through what was, at least for me, a very messy middle for a while. So I think what I appreciate about therapy is that it's about deepening your self-awareness and understanding. It's an inside job. Like, well, sometimes we just can't see our own patterns and behaviors, and we don't even know what we want or why we are reacting the way that we do until we talk through things. And so if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's convenient, flexible, it's affordable, it's totally online. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on your own journey of self-discovery from wherever you are right now. So just fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time if you need to for no additional charges. So discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash for the love today and you'll get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash for the love. Right. Let me, let Yay. me ask you this question, Dr. Burns, on the flip side of it. Yeah. Um, would you, do you have any recommendations 
for any young adults who are listening to this, how they can potentially support their parents in this new child. Is there a way to advise our newly adulted kids with boundaries, of course, because that's important and new and different and kind of weird sometimes. Um, How can you be a support to your parents? I know that's a weird role reversal, but here we are. Like we've raised you for 18 or 19 years and it's weird having you go. And so thoughts on that? Well, I do have some thoughts on it. In fact, I'm speaking at a college on it in September, and I'm already thinking about the uh, the conversation I'm going to have with these uh, students. One is, you, if they can, they've got to walk in their parents' shoes. So they have to understand this. They've never been a, an adult, so they don't know really what they're doing, right? I mean, sure. you know, I mean, they're the first to say that, probably. But yes. then also, their parents have never been parents of adults. So Correct. they're going through a rite of passage. Yes. Just like they are. So the the young adult has to go, oh, wait, my parents are going through it. They don't know what they're doing. That's um, right. They've got to reinvent their relationship with me. And so I think they can help the kid, the students, mm. the young people, the young adults can help by actually just walking in the shoe. What is, what is my mom going through? I mean, what is my dad mm. going through? And when they understand that, you know, maybe they'll call more often. Like, you know, I have three daughters and one just I mean, I have, if I called her 10 times, she doesn't pick up any time. And then I text her and she's like, she'll write right back. Sure. Right? So, but she has to understand that sometimes I just, I do want to talk to her. And I know I say this, you know, even in, in my book on empty nesting, I, I say to parents, I go, you know, your kids probably don't want to see you as much as you want to see them. But mm. if you're an adult kid and, and you're feeling somewhat responsible, my goodness, huh. they want to talk to you. They want to, I mean, they would love to get a note. We die for the affirmation. You know, when, when my yeah. daughter, Rebecca at her wedding, well, she actually had two weddings because she got married in COVID and then they got married in Italy. And so I, I did both weddings. I said, Hey, I hope your second you know, marriage is as good as your first. It was the same guy. Right. <laughs> so, but anyway, when she said, dad, when we have kids, we want to raise our kids like you and mom did, mm, honestly, I burst lovely. out crying. It was embarrassing. I went too. Because I burst out, I burst out crying because this was the kid who go, you guys are the most conservative. You're not oh, this. Yeah. You don't do this. Oh, yeah, sure. And and she ripped on us. And all of a sudden yeah. she's telling, I'm tearing up thinking yeah. about it right now. But her affirmation to me for one of the significant, most significant parts of my life, mm. that was, that was crucial. So if that's a kid lovely. can do that, mm. that's an incredible gift. Um, so I think that's one of them. Walk, walk in their shoes. And I, I think the other one is, is, you know, we, we still need your time. So, yeah. you know, I remember my parents, I didn't, you know, of course there were no cell phones when I was in college. Sure. I called them every Sunday, collect. Same. I had. Exact and, same. Yeah. But you know, I missed yeah. Sundays because I was busy and I was having fun and whatever. And yeah. I thought, who would have thought that they were, I never dawned on them, but they were sitting by the phone waiting for my call. I know. Well, we're not going to go out to dinner. Jim may call. That's and right. I, and, and with us, when I get a call from my kids that are more of a mentor or just a, you know, checking mm-hmm. in call, which doesn't happen very often, I admit, they've got to pay attention to us just ever so often. Okay. I realize you're going <laughs> yes. on with your life. You're, you're an I adult. Know. You've got other things, but just periodically pay attention. We, after all, we did wipe your nose. We wiped your butt. We, you no. know, we, we put some energy into this thing. <laughs> you know, they just don't think of us as real people though. We're parents. Right. Exactly. And so not only do they think we know what we're doing, I remember thinking my parents know what they're doing. They're grown. Like they must know something about putting a kid in college and they know how to handle this. I never really thought of them as superhuman in it. um, That like I do now, let me, uh, let me ask you this because you've got so much research to pull from and to reference so much data. I am finding that I'd like to hear you say you're ahead of me. So my oldest is just coming up on 25. So I'm in the, 17 to 24. That's where I'm at right. with the kids. Right. And right. so I've noticed that some of the college years, um, and even just shortly thereafter is some interesting push and pull. Yes. Um, neither one of us quite know how to do it. Right. So right. I feel like sometimes my kids are like, this is none of your business. I'm grown. Right. I'm an adult. Right. Adult right. who bills are paid by the parent, but what it's neither exactly. here nor there. Um, I'm, right. I'm, gro- I'm grown, um, yeah. and I, and then sometimes they are like, um, "You're not parenting me enough. This this bad thing has happened, right. and I think somehow it's your fault." Um, or right. I, you know, I, which is it? 
like just switch. It's, it's like, come in, go away. Um, and so I, I find that sometimes challenging and it, it discombobulates me as a mom. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm doing too much or not enough. And I, yeah. I have this weird suspicion that it's both. I, yeah. I feel like I actually feel both ways. Yeah. What do you have to say about this? Okay. Is this well, normal? When, when we said that to our mentors who are older than us, they laughed. <laughs> and they went, this is normal. And I'm like, I said, Hey, I'm actually mm-hmm. looking for some help here. That's right. And I remember this couple, we were actually at dinner with them and they, and we said basically that story and they just started laughing. They go, Oh yeah. We remember when that was the case. Um, you know, what's funny, it was kind of helpful. I mean, you know, like, you know, when somebody says, well, yeah, I, I, you are, uh, you know, I, I go, I'm either crazy or normal. And they go, well, you're kind of both, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. Well, so yeah. what, what I'm saying is that that's part of their journey. So mm-hmm. for us, we have to be students of the culture. So today's culture, you, your kids are Gen Z and yeah. your oldest is sort of a millennial, but probably right, right. On the, right on the edge. So with that, you know, what do they do? They meander toward responsibility. They meander toward um, marriage. You know, they get hmm. married a lot, a lot later in life. Yep, you got married right. at 19, right? All right. So you okay. became an right. adult. You had bills right. to pay. You had responsibilities. That's right. They don't. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think it's important for us to understand that we're going to get the push pull. Yeah. One of the things that, that I, I think parents do is we have to understand that if we are always giving them advice, which we have been pretty good at for 20 hmm. of their years, then they, they don't see that. They, I mean, they see that uns advice is taken as criticism, but they, and even if the advice is good, but what they see is that you don't trust them to be an adult and you go, well, mm-hmm. yeah, but I'm paying for your school. I'm paying for this. I totally get that. Yeah. But they, what we have to understand as parents, just like when they were five is that experience is a better teacher than advice. So if you can say to your kid, don't touch that fire, but they're going to touch the fire sometime. And then they'll quit touching the fire because they did it one time and it burnt. Right. Mm. So it's really hard for us as parents to, you know, you can't see this. We're, you know, we're zooming, but uh, I have a scar on my tongue because I bite my tongue all the time, even with Mm. my kids at 30 Uh, there. And my kids are in their 30s. So, you know, I am Mm -hmm. that, you know, kind of one step ahead. I do find that through the twenties, they're called emerging adults and they're trying to figure out what, who they are and what they're doing, that it does typically most of them settle down uh, once they do get married. So all of my daughters are now married one recently. And mm-hmm. in that it kind of does settle down and, you know, mm. we kind of get more attention and, and, and whatever, but yeah. with a parent, the question we have to ask is, are we helping or are we enabling dependency? Ah. And a lot of parents I think are enabling dependency. I mean, they, yeah. they're, they're, they mean to help. I mean, yes. our, our totally what we're, whatever we're thinking, we're trying to do mm. to help them, but sometimes we're enabling dependency. Yeah. And in doing that, that's not going to help. Or we have to understand that, um, you know, a lot of parents today, and especially ones who have just jumped into the empty nest with younger kids is, you know, they also are are in grief because their kids are violating their values or they're straying from whatever they taught them and whatnot. Okay. Now enlarge the relationship, um, mm, do stuff that, good. that, you know, still have, still work on that adult to adult friendship, because part of when your kids are younger, and you're right at the cusp of that with mm-hmm. even your youngest, you're moving from parent child to more of a adult to adult relationship. You're still yeah. a parent, but they're not your child anymore. They're an adult. Right. And, you know, even tough love says that you have to, um, you know, tough love says you, they're going to experience some consequences. You have to allow that consequences yeah. to happen. And that's rough because we can yeah. bail them out. Sometimes even parents try to bail them out with money. That That's not the answer. Totally. Yeah. I, it's it's true and it feels weird in our bones and in our bodies because we've not done it before we've um when when they're younger and there are places that we can can and even should feasibly step in that's yeah. all we've ever known and so exactly. that's that i don't know how else to categorize it but it kind of feels like a bit of a free fall, that free fall yeah. feeling. Like, right. I guess I'm just going to let them sit out there and flounder. And yeah. I can clearly see a path out of this. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I, but I'm just going to let them like slip slide around. And oh, it's it, hard. It, it is, it is hard. And I, oh, I think yeah. it's just helpful to say it's hard for everyone. And mm-hmm. it, we don't do it because it feels great. And it, it doesn't mean we don't lay in bed at night and worry. Yeah. About should I do more? Right. Are they going to pick the right thing? Yeah. But it's how it is. We were that way. I no, mean, it, our parents did not, our mind did not overreach 
at all. I mean, yeah. we were on our own. Now, granted, we were married like two young dum dums, but yeah. I mean, uh, my parents were just they were, and I never felt neglected. Like right. I, I appreciate it. So it's just, I think it's helpful to know this is just a new yeah. face, and it feels yeah. different than the one before, no, and that's it, normal. exactly. And and you know, and again, one of the things I like to say in the f- empty nest thing is when your kids find new experiences then your job is to follow their lead and you find some new experiences too. It doesn't mean that the new experiences are going to make what the decisions they're making or all the change, you know, just go away, but it still helps you. So when you have your friends that you talk about, when you have your friends, you can go to and go, you know what? I'm pulling out my hair. You can look at, you can see this on, you know, I have no hair. So I'm pulling out my hair um, because of what my kids are doing. And they go, yeah, we get it. They don't make it all better for you, but they right. hear you. Yeah. And and sometimes that's what we need more than the, you know, answers or that's here's right. the latest quick fix or here's the book that's going to change right. your life. Honestly, you, you need somebody to put their arm around that's you and it. just go, I get it. We've been there. Yep. And I hope it works out for you. Totally. It kind of sort of worked out for us, but it really was different. Mm. Um, Perfect. You know, we have too Let many dreams when our kids are so little. Yeah. Oh, right. That's back when I thought I could control this thing to the last mile. Exactly. Like I knew exactly what the formula was. <laughs> right. I knew how to like put all the right ingredients in and stir the pot and get the kids who did the thing. Like, yeah. I, I, listen, when you asked me if when I had kindergartners, I had it all sewn up. Sure. Absolutely sure. sewn up. I had I a it. plan. And then yeah. they turn out to be human people, just right. like we were. And they get to right. make their own decisions. Let's right. let's land the plane here. Based on all your work and all those zillions of parents that you coach, the young adults that you see, all your work and writing, what's the good news here? What yeah, great. What do yeah. you want the listeners to go, yeah. here's the upside, guys? Yeah. Well, that actually uh, people who make the right decisions as they enter the empty nest actually say that, you know, that they, they have never been happier. That doesn't mean life is perfect, but they've made the good decisions. They actually have found joy. You know, one of the constant phrases of my message is games are one in the second half, not in the first. And so in the second half, you can make some, some tweaks to it and you can win that game. But for us, that means we got to do some soul searching. We got to do some life, you know, like I said, it, it, it's not going to happen accidental. We're not going to do this by circumstance and chance. So really we need to develop a plan to mm. find that joy in the empty nest. And the people who do that, would they say life is perfect? No, there's nobody who, who says that. And if they are, not. they're lying to, yeah, to you not. and me. But what I find is that the people who, who actually engage in, you know, meaningful activities and, 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 and rekindle, if they're married, rekindle romance, rekindle the, that spark that literally teenagers have a way of just taking that spark and you know, sure it, right. So <laughs> those people who find that they do much better than mm. the people who just, you know, kind of let life take over. And That's next great. thing you know, you look up and you go, wow, I'm not happy. That's people great. can be, you know, people make choices. You can, you can make a, a good marriage. You can yeah. make a good, and again, I'm not saying that there aren't issues that cause as divorce and there aren't issues that cause brokenness or a kid, really good parents have kids who make really poor choices. That's going to happen. I mean, that's just, that's just the nature, but the people who find the joy in the empty nest are the ones who, who really made an effort to do that. And Mm. when you're 19, for me, when I'm 21, I didn't have any clue how to do that as an adult, but now as adults, I don't have to live by circumstance and chance. I actually have some tools in my toolkit. That's going to help me find that joy and uh, I need to lean into it. And, and yeah. so there's great news, but I can't do it alone. I'm going to have to do it with my tribe and you got to find a tribe. Mm-hmm. You found that I found that, but, mm-hmm. but a lot of your listeners have not found that yeah. and that's lonely and that's tough. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's easy, but you know, this is where they have to jump out and find that tribe to do life with in the empty nest. I love it. I say that all the time. Um, where, so for the people listening, they're like, I need a hundred more hours of this instruction. Uh, uh, Can you tell my community where to find you, all your work, all your books? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can find it on Amazon, um, but you can also go to homeword, W-O-R-D.com. And Homeward has lots of great stuff. We've got courses on this stuff. We've got free, uh, like today we sent out a culture brief every Friday, 7 million people get our culture brief uh, um, in a year. And it's on 
you know, where, what kids are doing. And I, I read it today and went, oh my gosh, I learned a lot about this. Mm. And it's just four, it takes four minutes. Uh, yeah. You know, so we've got blogs, we've got all that kind of good stuff. So they could go to homeward.com and they can, they can definitely find yeah. us. They can find our books and courses and seminars and life and all that. Perfect. I'll round up all yeah. those links for everybody. Yeah. All right. Last question. I've given to you this question before everybody gets it. Um, I should have gone back and listened to what you said the first time, but this is whatever you want to say, however you want to answer it. And whatever's true today, that's it. Uh, it can be funny. It can be precious. You just pick your feeling. Um, it's Barbara Brown Taylor's question. What is saving your life right now? Mm. Two things. One is I was in Minnesota in negative 14 degree talking uh, at a conference. And next week I'm going to Honolulu to speak at a conference oh, with my wife. Gosh. And that's, I'm thinking about the, I checked the weather today <laughs> to just make sure it was okay, that it wasn't snowing yeah. in Honolulu and it's not. So that is partly isn't. saving my life. I'll just tell you I that mean, right now. But um, the other thing that's fantastic. saving my life is, is, uh, is my wife, Kathy. She just went through two years since we've talked, she went through two years of uh, breast cancer treatment and it has caused her as she looks at her mortality and she actually has done really good. So it's a great story. And, and I realize they're sad stories, but mm -hmm. hers is a great story, but, but it has caused her to um, be an even more incredible person. And last night we were just sitting on the couch. Literally, we hardly do this. I wish we did it more, but we we're just sitting on the couch kind of re talking. And she goes, you know what? I'm almost glad I got breast cancer because it, yeah. it made me look at um, the things that matter most. And I just, grabbed her hand. I gave her a kiss and just said, I am so proud of how you've done yeah. this. And and she did it with tears and she did it with all the other things. But of course. Um, I would say that in this empty nest, our, we re-sparked our marriage because honestly, we have what we call a high maintenance marriage and the empty nest, we still have a high maintenance marriage, but the empty nest has caused us to do more things together, yeah. have better conversations together. And I would say that, you know, I never thought marriage was a 50, 50 thing, but I thought it was sort of, I think it's like maybe 75, 25 on Kathy's part in mm. terms of just making, um, you know, some really good things happen in our, and again, not perfect, but make some good things happen in our life. So those are the two things that are saving me right now. Perfect. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I hope that you and that lovely wife are going to carve out a few extra days in Honolulu. I mean, while you're there, you might we as well stay. At, well, that's uh -huh. what we said. You, uh, uh -huh. you, you said the same words that my wife uh -huh. said, and I'm happy to have accepted that. That's as, great. Uh, that's great advice. Your work is real yeah. hard. Get out there to yeah. Honolulu, help the parents <laughs> lay in the sun. <laughs> we'll be thinking fondly of you. Okay. 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 Good um, to be with you. Always. Thanks for being back on today. Sure. I just my love pleasure. it every time you're here and yeah. I learned so much from you and I'm always encouraged yeah. by you. Thank you for just continuing yeah. to serve this yeah. space where yeah. you're right. There isn't a ton out there and we're yeah. wanting to do this well, but we've never done it. And no. so thank you for your just being yeah. who you are in the world. And yeah. Until next time, I'll get you back yes. in. If I need to use your daughters to get to you, I'll yeah. do it. I'm, I have Anytime. no shame. Yeah. Okay, great to be with you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys, as promised, I will round up all the links for you. If you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, I will put all things Dr. Burns there for you. Um, because again, he's got parenting stuff, no matter really what stage of parenting you're in. And so even if you're not quite to the empty nest space yet, he's got stuff for you too. So I'll make sure that you have that um, over on my website. And I can't wait to hear what you think about this one. This is a conversation a lot of us are hungry to have, and we're not sure where to turn. Um, and it's kind of a, it's sort of an on-ramp, right? Like there's this earlier part, we're getting ready for it. There's this beginning part where it's so jarring and like dramatic. And then there's just the middle part where we're sorting out a new rhythm to our relationships. I mean, this is, this is a long one and we should be talking more about it. And so I'm glad that we are here. You guys, thanks for being in the middle series. We have so many good guests and important and interesting and helpful conversations built into this series. And I think you're going to love it. All right. See you next week.